a new a new what? And that's what I thought you said. A happy time. Okay. Um, who's gonna be happy? Uh huh. But 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 that'll make a lot of people unhappy. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. But why not just call it a second unhappy time? Huh? Okay. January 16th, 1942. If your enemy has no supplies, then he will eventually lose the war. And if he relies on the seas to get those supplies, and circumstances suddenly allow you the opportunity to do some real sabotage to those supply lines, well then, you might call that time a happy time. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Soviet Union launched a gigantic counteroffensive against the German invaders along pretty much the entire front. In Southeast Asia, the Japanese occupied Manila and launched an offensive against the American and Filipino defenders on Bataan Peninsula. They also launched another offensive on Malaya and began sending troops towards Burma. This week, they begin yet another offensive from the waters beyond the South China Sea. On the 11th, the Japanese finally declare war on the Dutch with an invasion of the Dutch East Indies, making landings on Tarakan and Minahasa Peninsula. The operation will in fact be a three-pronged attack. The Tarakan force is the central force and will try to occupy Borneo. The western attack comes from Sarawak and will land on Java and Sumatra. The eastern attack begins with landings on Minahasa and Amboina and then will attack Bali Timor, and Eastern Java. Tarakan Falls already the 12th. It and Manado are soon made into air bases for further Japanese attacks. In Malaya, they take Kuala Lumpur this week on the 11th, and by the 15th are south of Malacca on the coast, and elements of the Japanese 5th Division are fighting the Australians at Batu Anam. More on that next week. Also, elements of the Japanese 55th Division enter Burma north of Mergi on the Kra Isthmus the 15th. As for the attacks by the 65th Brigade that began last week on the American positions on Bataan, they're actually pretty well contained for now. They're also one of the few Japanese units that actually gets hit by any enemy artillery in this first month or so of all the Japanese offensives. American Commander Douglas MacArthur does have a decent amount of big guns here, and on the 9th, one shot kills most of the local Japanese artillery command. By the 13th, the Japanese are making progress in the east, but not in the west, but the fighting is pretty heavy all over. MacArthur has told the troops defending that help is on the way. Thousands of troops and, and hundreds of planes, but as we've seen, no such help is actually coming. But even had they been en route, Japan has Manila Bay blockaded, so there's no guarantee they would arrive anyhow. Side note, there are American troops traveling to a new war zone this week, General Russell Hartle's 34th Division, 4,000 strong, the first U.S. servicemen to arrive in Britain. America's War Plans Department has decided, as I said, that they cannot send a relief convoy of men or supplies to MacArthur's forces on the Philippines. MacArthur has not been specifically told this though, and the US West Coast radio stations that can be picked up at Bataan broadcast the opposite. On the 10th, while touring the Abu Kai defenses, MacArthur tells some of his officers, help is definitely on the way. We must hold out until it arrives. But you know, it isn't just MacArthur who thinks help is on the way. The American public thinks a huge revenge counteroffensive against the Japanese is in the works and is soon to be launched. The print and broadcast media all foster this belief and that MacArthur will soon be relieved, which he won't. Now on the 11th, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill returns to Washington DC after a week's vacation in Florida so he and American President Franklin Roosevelt can finish up the Arcadia Conference. But though they've agreed on a combined Allied Chiefs of Staff, they have not made any progress in reconciling the conflicting demands of the operations proposed by Britain and America. Well, they agree to send US forces to garrisons in Iceland and Ireland, but that's really it. See, the real problem is shipping. 
or the lack thereof. They've in general agreed on attacking in North Africa and securing the Mediterranean. Okay, more like Roosevelt has overruled those who wish to build up force in Britain for an attack on the European continent. See, most of his advisors understand the value of North African operations in securing lines of supply and communication and giving a base for an eventual attack across the Mediterranean. But they are opposed on strategic grounds to what they see as a dissipation of force. Roosevelt favors an attack in North Africa because it's an opportunity to bring the war to the Germans now. And he thinks it is important to do that for the American people, for morale. The Arcadia Conference agrees that they will go through with some sort of plan to attack North Africa. Churchill envisions 90,000 troops being sent to North Africa, but that is not going to happen because priority has to go to maintaining and securing the Atlantic convoys to keep Britain and the USSR supplied and fighting. For his part in helping to do that, on the 16th, FDR issues Executive Order 9024, establishing the War Productions Board. Donald Nelson is its first chairman. Its job is to convert American industry from peacetime to wartime production, deal with resources and distribution, and ration things like, like gasoline and rubber in future. Another Allied plan for the future happens this week when representatives meet in London and announce that they will prosecute Axis war criminals after the war. Details of the killings in German-occupied Poland and Western Russia had begun to reach and to horrify the Allied governments, including those in exile from the very lands in which the tyranny was at its most intense. On January 13th, the representatives of nine occupied countries meeting in London signed a declaration that all those guilty of war crimes would be punished after the war, whether they have ordered them, perpetrated them, or participated in them. War crimes are defined by the Geneva Conventions, and there are provisions relating to the treatment of civilians or wounded service personnel on the high seas. I mention this because Operation Paukenschlag, drumbeat, begins this week on the 13th. This will become known to the Germans as the second happy time. What it is, is German subs beginning operations just off the US coast, now that the US is at war. Many in the German Admiralty do not support this, but U-boat boss Carl Dönitz gives it the go. Only his Type 9 subs can really do such long-range patrols, though. Five such ships have been en route from France since December. Even though British intelligence has given warning that this is going to happen and has suggested blackout measures and convoy shipping, the U.S. is still, it's still observing virtual peacetime conditions. Lighthouses and buoys are still lit as are even ships at night. Merchants radio their positions in clear, non-coded language. The British offer advice on naval protection, but the US Navy does not take it. So, spoiler, over 150,000 tons of shipping is sunk in just the first month. In unrelated submarine action in the Pacific this week, the American carrier Saratoga is damaged near Hawaii by Japanese submarine I-6. She returns to Pearl Harbor for repairs. Submarine attacks are not the only surprises the Axis has in store for their enemies. On the 12th in North Africa, Erwin Rommel's subordinates propose a surprise attack on the British and he agrees to it. See, he's been getting reinforcements, specifically tanks, for weeks now, and they start to prepare this new offensive in such secrecy that they tell neither the German nor the Italian high commands which is likely a good thing for them since, as we've seen, the British have cracked the Italian codes and some of the German ones. After pulling back a couple weeks ago, the Axis are now strongly established between Mersa Brega and Alam El Magad, and British 8th Army Commander Neil Ritchie does not have the force and the supply lines to make them go anywhere else. 
Ritchie's supply problems were now immense, and by late December it had become clear that pursuit by anything more than a weak British force was out of the question. He was 300 miles from his main base at Tobruk, and this, together with petrol wastage and a shortage of vehicles, increasing attacks by enemy aircraft and U-boats on British shipping, and the impossibility of using captured ports made his whole administrative position extremely precarious. But if his is precarious, someone else's is finished. On the 16th, German Field Marshal Wilhelm von Lieb is out as Army Group North Commander and is replaced by Georg von Kuchler. Since the beginning of December, all three Army Group Commanders have been replaced. Also, two of the four Panzer Army Commanders, Hepner and Guderian, and 33 other officers with divisional or higher command. This is because of their requests to make withdrawals. Adolf Hitler now totally runs military planning and decision-making. His Soviet counterpart, Joseph Stalin, is making decisions of his own this week. On the 10th, he instructs the Red Army to hunt the Germans westward without pause, force them to expend their reserves up to the spring, at a time when we will deploy fresh, major reserves just when the Germans will have no effective reserves left, so that this will accomplish the total destruction of the Hitlerite forces in the year 1942. But this is John Erickson's commentary on those instructions. As Stalin never visited the front, in spite of the many fictions that he did, and since commanders who were summoned to him had to face also his entourage, the chances of Stalin being persuaded of reality, stiffening German resistance, decimated Soviet formations, overextended fronts, dangerous multiplicities of objectives, vanished almost completely from the horizon of decision-making. In all this airless artificiality, caverned in the bunker in the Kremlin, the doctrine of Stalinist infallibility revealed in war just as it had come to prevail in peace. But on the battlefronts, it needed more than Stalin's verbal grape shot to seep away the great iron rocks of German resistance which stood out in a Soviet sea. The Red Army Offensive is now stretched out over 1,500 kilometers and basically everyone is attacking. Pavel Karachkin's northwestern front between Lakes Ilmen and Seliger began attacks the 7th aimed at taking the German depot at Staraya Russa. They sent out the heavy tanks, glider troops, and armored sleds carrying infantry of Morozov's 11th Army into the flank of the German 16th Army, facing stubborn resistance all week. Karachkin's other big drive began in the wee hours on the 9th, with nearly 10 divisions of Perkayev's 3rd and Yeromenko's 4th shock armies heading across the ice of Lake Seliger. These were the units I mentioned the other week that had no food. They did get fed on the first day of the attack, though. Also, they have in fact trained for days without food at a time, so it's not something they can't manage if needed. If and when they capture the German supplies at Toropets, they can eat all they want. Yeromenko's forces drive first at Peno, the junction of German army groups north and center, and it falls, punching a hole in the German lines. Perkayev gets a bit hung up heading towards Kholm, but after a few days, they are rolling. And by late in the week, Yeromenko's fourth is driving through Andreapol, taking it as the week ends, and then making for Toropets and all of its supplies. Stavka ordered Ivan Konev to have his Kalinin front take Rzhev on the 11th or the 12th at the latest. And his units have swept around it to the west, but they will meet pretty desperate resistance. Germans here point right into the flanks of Konev's assault troops, and they are fighting to hold the rzhev sichovka vyazima railway. If they lose that, then the German 9th Army is likely history and indeed Rzhev and Sushovka stay in German hands the rest of the week. Georgi Zhukov's western front continues its attacks, the right wing towards Volokolamsk, the center for Mozhesk and Gzhatsk, and then for Vyazima, and the left towards Miatlevo and Yuknov, and then after that to reach the motorway and also make for Vyazima. Zhukov's left is to exploit the Kaluga-Belyov gap, 
which puts the German 4th Army in danger of being isolated. Medin falls on the 14th, but it is a great struggle to gain any ground after that. Though as the week ends, 416 paratroops land and take the Miatlevo airfield near the Median Road. They will link up with the infantry next week. The attacks in the north by Kirill Meretskov's Volkhov front begin the 13th, but make very little headway by the end of the week. In the south, in the Crimea, Erich von Manstein's 30th Corps has had to postpone attacks on Sevastopol until the situation to the east the Soviet landings in December that took Feodosia and drove the Germans from their Kerch positions, can be resolved. So his troops make a forced march across the Crimea and attack now on the 15th, catching the Soviets in the middle of preparing their own offensive. As the week ends, the Soviets are being pushed back. And as their week ends, so does mine. A week of dozens of Soviet attacks in the USSR, dozens of Japanese attacks in Southeast Asia, the beginning of dozens of attacks at sea off the U.S. East Coast and plans for attacks to resume in North Africa. Submarine attacks right off the eastern seaboard of America. The first sinking that happens this week actually happens within sight of Long Island by U-123. It will sink seven ships before it runs out of torpedoes. Those first five U-boats will sink 23 total in just weeks. And the U.S. does not have many ships really suitable for convoy escort work. Got to be pretty maneuverable. Got to stay on station for long periods. Got to carry a lot of depth charges. Got to travel pretty slowly. But the Atlantic is Britain's and the USSR's lifeline for American supplies. If the Germans can cut that off or seriously damage it, Happy time indeed. The US was brought actively into the war by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor six weeks ago. If you didn't see our 10 part real time coverage of the events of that day, you can check out part one right here any second now. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Joel Schaefer. It is the Time Ghost Army that finances all of our projects. So join the army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. Do not forget to subscribe. You're my kind of wonderful.